everyone. Uh, welcome to ICANX Talks again. We come every Friday. I'm very happy to be here with you. And I'm the moderator today. I'm Miso Kim from Sungkyunkwan University, Korea, South Korea. So I think um, I believe that some of you may know me already. So because I'm a very frequently appearing moderator here. And here um, today, so I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, schedule for for this month. And today we have two distinguished researchers who were awarded uh, the uh, the ICANX Rising Stars last year, 2022. And we are going to have amazing two speakers. So I'm going to introduce them soon. And next week we are going to have Professor Federico Rosé from INRS Center. And then in the following week we are going to have Professor. Andrea Alu um, and Professor Pat, uh, Patrice Simon and Kylie Catchpole. So you can see that we are going to have speakers from all over the world. So enjoy all over the world. And so today, so we have two distinguished researchers from one from our Northwestern, from Pro Professor Jonathan Ravney, and one uh, is Professor, the other one is Professor uh, Chase uh, Kao. Uh, from Case Western Reserve University. Both were uh, the uh, awardees of the ICANX Rising Stars, uh, which were very competitive last year. So uh, we, can, we are very proud of them. And I'm very uh, pleased to introduce them and have them here to hear about their researches research talk. So, and then uh, the first speaker will be Professor Jonathan, uh, Professor Jonathan uh, from Northwestern University. So let me introduce his bio a little bit before he, uh, he comes here. So Professor uh, Jonathan is a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Department of Material Science and Engineering at Northwestern University currently. And he got his PhD at Cornell and he did his uh, master's and PhD at Stanford University. And he did his postdoctoral fellow as a Marie Curie, uh, uh, which a very distinguished one, postdoctoral fellow in France. And then he worked at a company for one year. And then he joined the faculty at Northwestern in 2017. And I love this sentences here. So his research explores uh, fundamentals of soft polymeric electronic materials and how they can be applied to solve hard problems in bioelectronics. So we are going to uh, he's going to share his research talk about this topic today. And he got so many uh, awards, like um, um, including uh, he's a recipient, he, he's being a recipient of a faculty uh, early career development from NSF and the, another uh, one of the fellowship from the Alfred Sloan Foundation and MRS Outstanding Early Career Investigator. And there are so many. So um, I'm going to stop uh, listing them. And today he's going to add one more one. So like I can, I can ask Rising Star. Congratulations. And then this is your stage, Jonathan. Great. Thank you so much, Misa. Let me share my screen. OK. Is that sharing okay? Yes, it looks very good. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, again, my name is Jonathan Rivne. I'm at Northwestern. Um, I've been at, <clears throat> at Northwestern for uh, about six years now. Uh, and uh, in my talk, I wanna focus on a number of uh, applications of using soft electroactive materials and bioelectronics and really give you a flavor uh, for how we can use materials design strategies to explore new function and new properties. So I'm sure many of you may have seen this before, but I think it's good to, to lay a foundation here and we talk about the interface between biological systems and more traditional microelectronic systems. There's a number of different modalities uh, that make the interface between biology and microelectronics actually quite challenging. Uh, that includes uh, mechanics, for example, in biology, we often consider the tissue uh, to be quite soft uh, and quite dynamic, as we see in this uh, schematic of a, of a pumping heart, whereas in microelectronics, generally we think of it, of it as, as rather hard, uh, especially if we think of the hardware in our uh, computers and phones, uh, and quite static. 
Uh, and communication biology occurs by motion of ions and biorecognition, uh, whereas communication in microelectronics is almost exclusively with electrons and holes. And so there's a number of different ways to bridge these different modalities of mismatch. Um, we're going to hear a number of strategies today. Um, uh, as well as, you know, uh, other approaches where you can use deterministic structures to make things stretchable, for example, and conformal. Today, I want to focus on a class of materials that I'll be calling organic mixed conductors or OMEX. And the reason we're really excited about these materials is that they really do help to bridge a number of these different modalities. So what do these mixed conductors look like? You can see here on the left, generally they're they're uh, polymers that have a conjugated backbone, which allows for the pi, pi delocalization. So it allows you to have electronic transport along the, the backbone. And they have either a uh, ion solvating uh, side chain, like a ethylene glycol uh, side chain, or a charged uh, group, or they're complexed with a uh, another polymer that has fixed charges on it. And generally, this gives you kind of a swollen uh, type architecture that allows for ions to readily get into the film uh, and for uh, uh, efficient hole transport and electron transport as well. So this allows you to um, uh, both transport electronic carriers, but also have this great tunability of properties that you can have through synthesis. It allows for low temperature processing since these are weakly bonded uh, van der Waals solids. Um, but really, these last three are the ones that I think make this, cl this class of material interesting for bioelectronics. One is that the mechanical properties are more closely matched to biosystems. They can be almost hydrogel-like, and that they have high ion mobilities and a high uh, charge storage capacity, which allows, you to, uh, um, uh, which allows electronic excitations to uh, affect properties. Now, one of the things about these materials is that they can also be processed into a lot of different form factors. For example, you can make fibers or scaffolds out of conducting polymers. You can print conducting hydrogels or conducting uh, stents or other scaffolds. And you can still process them with typical photolithography techniques onto ultra-thin um, uh, plastic sub substrates for uh, wearable or implantable applications, kind of more traditional thin film electronics. So one of the things that I alluded to that makes these materials quite interesting is the fact that both ionic and electronic transport occur within the bulk of the material, right? That you can actually get um, efficient uh, charging of the entire volume of material. And this wasn't actually known uh, until we specifically uh, measured it. You could kind of deduce it, but what we did is we looked at the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, the capacitance that we got out of that measurement, as a function of a volume of a film of this uh, P.PSS, which is a commercially available material. And we found the capacitance scaled with volume quite nicely and linearly over, in this case, you can see three orders of magnitude. So if we compare now a electrode made out of a uh, ion impenetrable metal compared to a conducting polymer, you can kind of see this picture here where ions uh, are able to infiltrate the bulk and electrostatically couple to charges on the backbone. So what does this mean? For a thickness of about 130 nanometers for the a film like P.PSS, you can get an effective capacitance of 500 microfarads per centimeter squared. Now that's 100 times larger than the double layer capacitance you would get on a bare metal electrode. And it's important to keep in mind that with materials design, as I'll show you in a moment, some of the peak numbers for volumetric capacitance in these materials now reach almost a thousand farads per centimeter cube. So now you're talking about uh, more than uh, a thousand fold um, uh, or two thousand fold higher double higher capacitance than the double layer. Now this is really critical. Uh, it means that um, uh, when we have a lowering of that effective, uh, a higher effective capacitance, it means that we have a lowering of this effective impedance at the electrode electrolyte interface, which uh, is thought to and and known to uh, increase the quality of recordings, increase signal to noise ratios, and increase current injection limit for stimulation when you're using them as uh, uh, stimulation electrodes. So that's electrodes. That's talking about the materials themselves. What about transistors? Now, using electrolyte gated transistors is actually quite common in bioelectronics. Uh, it's been used for a long time. Uh, ion selective field effect transistors, for example, are a good, are a good uh, uh, kind of set point here. Uh, and why do we want to use transistors in bioelectronics? Well, if they're effectively a really efficient switch, right? A small change in a uh, gate voltage input 
leads to a large change in the current between the source and the drain, which we can consider our output in this case. And that's really critical for sensing, right? A small input, something that you want to sense, you want to get a large output so you can effectively amplify it. But in a lot of these cases, you can see that their uh, operation depends on the accumulation or uh, formation of a depletion region at the semiconductor channel due to the accumulation of these ions at a double layer. Now, what if we applied the concepts that I talked about, have an active material made out of soft polymer materials that can actually uptake those ions and lead to a bulk change in conductance of the channel? That's what we call an organic electrochemical transistor, and I'll be talking a lot about those uh, today in a number of applications. They've been used, of course, as individual sensors of potential, of uh, impedance across uh, barrier membranes, or as biosensors, or they've been integrated uh, together um, with other electrochemical transistors or other passive components to make uh, analog, digital, and neuromorphic circuits. So what does this type of transistor look like? Well, it looks a lot like a regular thin film transistor. You have a source and a drain electrode. You bridge that with a channel of this active material. I'm showing an example here of this thionothiophene bithiophene system. Uh, and you get a um, uh, current voltage characteristics, these output curves, the drain current as a function of the, uh, the drain voltage that look a lot like a uh, regular thin film transistor. We have a rather low hysteresis, you can see here in the output curve, and pretty good uh, on-off ratios. I'll be talking a little bit about transconductance, which is the slope of this transfer curve. Uh, and one of the things that's really interesting that we found is that um, really the transconductance, uh, if we consider the different factors that go into a transistor here, the geometrical terms, the charge carrier mobility, and the volumetric capacitance, um, really scales a lot like you'd expect from a field effect transistor except that you've pulled out this thickness term, the physical thickness of the film, and you have now a volumetric capacitance here. So if you uh, kind of uh, um, uh, multiply those out, that would effectively be your capacitance per unit area that you have in a thin film transistor. And so you have your geometry terms, your bias terms. And of course, um, one thing that we found very important is this figure of merit, this, this uh, product of the electronic mobility and the volumetric capacitance as something that is uh, a way to benchmark the performance of these different materials. Now, as new materials have come, uh, come to light, have been developed, um, one of the things that my group is really interested in is actually studying and understanding how molecular design and processing affect performance. I won't go into deep uh, detail into this part of, of my group's research, but one thing that we found is that structure, because we're exposing these, uh, these molecules to uh, these polymers to an electrolyte, usually uh, aqueous base, so lots of water and ions, and when you apply a bias, you have a lot of infiltration of both water and ions, and that changes the structure. And so we spent a lot of time developing tools to understand uh, how these materials change under operation. Um, we can usually quantify quite small changes in structure um, that we can see here with um, uh, X-ray scattering, telling us about the crystalline packing within these materials under different conditions, right? exposed to an electrolyte, doped or de-doped. And we can actually monitor the changes in the scattering pattern as we're cycling these films, right? So you can really see the breathing here of this pi stacking peak when you look at that uh, thiophene-based uh, polymer. So again, without going into great detail into the material side of this work, um, you know, a lot of work has, has uh, come both from the, in, in the effort to develop new materials um, that are good mixed conductors for electrochemical transistors, but also repurposing materials from other fields. So we have a different number of different classes of materials that now we know operate as mixed conductors that are polymeric in nature. Uh, and really, uh, there's been some exciting advancements. There's been examples now of uh, small molecules that can be used as active layers. This is work from Christian Nielsen at Queen Mary, as well as um, uh, more recently, uh, two, 2D polymers or covalent organic frameworks, which can give us better control now over the free volume uh, that for ion infiltration. Uh, and this is work in collaboration with Will Victel at Northwestern. And all the time, whenever a new material comes out, one of our goals is to actually start to benchmark these materials so that we can understand how they're better than their predecessors and potentially why. So you can see here all the dots in gray. These are materials that we were uh, aggregating and reporting on uh, before 2017. And since then, a lot of new teams uh, around the world have been getting involved uh, and, and uh, synthesizing new uh, polymers. And now we can see that the performance of these materials, now this is plotted the uh, whole or electron mobility as a function of that volumetric capacitance 
So keep in mind the product of these two is our figure of merit. So we want to be further up and to the right if we want a high transconductance material. So you can see here a lot of new p-type materials, and most of the work with n-types has really come in the last five or six years. And you can see uh, rapid improvement here, where now the performance of the highest uh, performing n-types is starting to uh, match that of the the p-type or whole transporting materials. So I want to jump right into the main uh, aspects of what I wanted to talk about today. I, I, I mentioned a little bit about these new materials and understanding their fundamentals. That's really looking at the kind of interfacial and bulk um, microstructure and performance of these materials. Um, of course, we like to integrate them into devices, electrodes and sensors, as I've alluded to. But this level is not sufficient when we're talking about bioelectronic systems. At the end of the day, you have to do something with these materials. So uh, you have to wire it out to some sort of intermediate signal processing stage for preamplification, potentially multiplexing, uh, and some uh, um, uh, data processing, and also send this information to the back end to maybe further amplify it uh, and 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 do something with the information. So one of the thing that's one of the things that's really motivated uh, the work that my group's been doing is starting to think about how we can leverage the unique properties of these polymers to start to bring some of that higher function that we have at the back end, bring it to the front end, right? To potentially have more compact and potentially um, uh, more power efficient um, uh, integration of these active materials. So I want to tell you three short stories uh, that kind of are along this line. And so I'll jump right in. So the first one I want to talk about, uh, this is work from a really talented uh, postdoc, uh, Xu Dongji. He um, uh, has been looking at how we can uh, leverage the trapping and transport uh, in these materials uh, in order to uh, achieve certain applications. And specifically, I'll talk about a short story here um, where we've been able to engineer non-volatility uh, in these electrochemical transistors for synaptic transistors for applications in neuromorphic computing. All right, so in this case, you know, I'm showing here a picture of uh, uh, neurons, a picture of uh, neurons uh, in a, a cartoon of neurons here, and drawing the analogy between the connection between those neurons and a uh, transistor-based device. So a synapse uh, can uh, process and store information at the same time, and mimicking this behavior presents a shift in computing architecture. So just as um, when, an, uh, when you have an action potential, uh, it can induce uh, the release of neurotransmitter, that can transfer information between two neurons and tune a synaptic weight. You can think of that the analogy with a transistor where you apply a pulsed gate voltage, uh, and that induces ion material interactions that tune the channel conductance. And if you can somehow store the information about the change in conductance, you're essentially on your way towards a neuromorphic device. So it's possible to use a single OECT to mimic a synapse and an OECT based circuit to mimic a uh, neural. Um, uh, neural circuit or function. And this has been uh, integrated into a number of different applications. You have examples of synaptic circuits, right, where uh, basically you're taking a few of these synaptic transistors and some sensors to mimic sensory processing. And you have applications here in associative learning, orientation detection. And then on the other extreme, you have these artificial neural networks that are more complex computing systems that are inspired by the human brain. And this is uh, usually implemented in a large array uh, and uh, the weights between those uh, different nodes uh, mimic the brain. And so previous approaches using organic tra transistors have achieved some of this type of function, um, but oftentimes they can either, they're either irreversible, they might require high write biases, uh, or uh, might require you to decouple the read and write processes um, using things like an access device or, or a, a memristor in order to achieve their function. And so the questions that we want to ask is how can we leverage the, the uh, engineering of transport and trapping in order to achieve uh, this kind of non-volatile behavior that would be interesting for neuromorphic applications. And so we turn to you know, a material that we've used in the past. This is a, a P-dot tosylate. And so this is uh, similar to P-dot PSS. This is a vapor phase polymerized uh, P-dot. And the reason this is exciting is you can actually uh, load into the microstructure other polymers. So in this case, we loaded polytetrahydrofuran. Right, which is this polymer shown down here. And when we do that, when we load 80% of this PTHF into this into this uh, uh, P.dot tosylate, you can see the IV characteristics here in blue open a really nice uh, hysteresis loop in our IV characteristics. Uh, 
This results in the ability to now uh, um, uh, apply a pulse to the gate voltage, and you get a, um, a stable memory level when you pass a certain threshold. I show here also longer term, uh, uh, longer term measurement showing the retention, as well as the ability to reversibly and repeatedly move between different states when you apply different pulses. And so um, this type of OECT not only has this long retention and stable operation, but also the low write biases that are um, really typical of these electrolyte gated devices. We've been able to show uh, that this OECT mimics the synaptic behavior, the short-term potentiation and long-term uh, plasticity, um, as well as uh, its use in associative learning circuits. But instead of showing you more about the application, I wanted to get back to this materials question. Basically, what we've been able to do is to leverage structural and compositional probes, so GWAX and XPS, to build a picture of the operation mechanism. And what we find, in this case, I'm showing a cartoon now of only the PTHF uh, loaded uh, material, is that PTHF serves the role of basically trapping sodium ions that are in our electrolyte in the high resistance state. And you can see that here via XPS. Right? And so the trapping of these sodium ions really leads to the retention of the state once you remove the reductive bias. And what's really interesting for us here is that we're borrowing techniques from battery electrolytes. Right? Basically, it's been shown that when you vary the ether oxygen content, when you compare polyethylene uh, oxide or PEG, uh, with um, uh, PTHF, which has a lower density of those ether oxygens, uh, there's less ability for those uh, cations to hop between um, between uh, ether oxygen sites. And so it kind of acts as a trap for the ions, uh, giving us a mechanism here for non-volatility. I'm going to move on to the next short story here. And that's where we can um, use the fact that uh, we have bulk transporting in these systems uh, in order to achieve new architectures that might be useful for signal processing. So this is work from a, a grad student, uh, Reem Rashid, and, uh, and Reem Rashid, and we uh, I show here an example of a complementary inverter. Right? And so why am I showing a complementary inverter? By the way, these little circles here, this is the circuit element for a electrochemical transistor. Now, a complementary inverter basically gives you a high output voltage when you have a low input voltage and vice versa with a high input voltage. And the thing that's interesting uh, for sensing is that you also have a really sharp transition region where you have a high, uh, uh, a large change in output voltage for a small change in input voltage. So if you want to do some analog amplification for very small signals, this can be uh, an interesting approach to take. So the question that my student Reem asked is, can we essentially take this building block of digital logic and fold it up so that it's essentially really, really small? Uh, on uh, at the interface between the uh, bioelectronic system and the and and the tissue or the the biological system, and so that's what she did. Um, you can basically come up with a strategy now where you have a stack of insulating and conducting uh, traces, and you can either etch or you know with a laser or with photolithography a trench into this structure. And if you can coat the sidewalls of the structure, you essentially have two transistors that are facing each other. This is on the size scale of about 10 to 20 microns, right? The kind of size scale you'd expect from recording electrodes. And by doing this, uh, you effectively uh, now have two transistors that are co-localized and you can wire them up as an inverter. But you might say, well, I mean, it can't be the same material necessarily because a complementary inverter needs whole and electron transporting devices. Well, luckily working with our synthetic collaborators, we had a number of materials that serve this function. They're uh, called ambipolar materials. And by integrating these types of materials, you can actually see that you can show as a proof of concept that you do get this inverter characters characteristic. Of course, you have the non-idealities a little bit here at the wings, uh, and your transition voltage is not exactly where you'd expect uh, from theory, but that's because the two branches of this complementary inverter are not fully balanced. Nevertheless, you get a gain here up to 30x. Right, so what does this mean? This means that on the footprint of 10 to 20 microns, you can locally amplify that biosignal 30 times, right, right at the interface. And you're still able to do other processing and amplification later down the line. So what Reem did was try to uh, show that this uh, concept could work. And we just wired it up on the benchtop to measure ECG signals. And you can see the output from a vertical OECT cofacial pair uh, gives you uh, significantly higher signals. In this case, you can see it by the, the amplitude of that um, voltage signal compared to a benchtop digital multimeter tool uh, that we have uh, in the lab as well.
Now, this is quite exciting. There's been a lot of work on complementary inverters with mixed conductors. This is work out of Sweden uh, from uh, Simona Fabiano's group, uh, actually using a true complementary approach where they have an N-type BBL polymer here and a P-type similar to the ones I'm discussing. And you also see very similar gains up to 25 or 30 fold in a single stage inverter. Now, the main difference between this particular work and ours uh, is that here we're talking about a printed uh, uh, inverter on the uh, on the centimeter scale with transistors on the millimeter scale. Of course, this can be scaled down with printing and, and photolithography. But the point is that with our cofacial approach, we can now do a single uh, an OECT and single stage inverter on the 10 to 100 micron size scale, which would be important for integration strategies. We also started working uh, more recently with our collaborators here at Northwestern, uh, Antonio Facchetti and, and Tobin Marks, um, to essentially redesign this type of strategy. So instead of now making co-facial transistors, what if we can use a material strategy to start to stack these active materials on top of each other? You can see here an example of that. And they were able to do this by integrating this redox inert syn cell system that kind of scaffolds the material and still allows them to take up ions and essentially make, again, on the uh, 100 micron and below size scale, a stacked complementary inverter, in this case, reaching, uh, reaching uh, gains of about 150x. So I think there's a really bright future for these types of approaches with mixed conductors as both circuit elements and uh, analog uh, amplifying um, elements. Now, the last story <clears throat> I want to tell is a more recent one. And this is how can we rethink how we amplify biochemical sensors, specifically um, redox reporter-based aptamer sensors or apta sensors. And so this question of integrating uh, aptamers, especially redox active um, uh, aptamers with OECTs is one that uh, has been tried for quite some time. And I'll talk about some of the pitfalls that have uh, uh, plagued the field. So why are we interested in aptamers for sensing? In this case, I'll be talking about the test case of testing, um, sensing TGF beta-1, transforming growth factor beta-1, which is actually a molecule than a cytokine that enables differentiation of fibroblasts to myofibroblasts uh, to assist in wound healing. So um, uh, that's our test case in this case. So why are we interested in aptamers? Well, these are generally stable. They're tailorable. You can change their, their structure and engineer them. Um, they're relatively low cost relatively small, so they're not massive like, um, like antibodies, and have relatively facile functionalization. So in this case with TGF beta-1, when you don't have a binding event, your redox reporter at the end of this aptamer, which is a methylene blue reporter, uh, has a higher charge transfer, whereas when you have a binding event, uh, that methylene blue moves further away from the electrode, and so the transfer between that redox reporter and the gold uh, is reduced. So you see a reduction in the peak. And so our question is, can we use the OECT to amplify the signal from an electrochemical, sorry, uh, uh, electrochemical based uh, APTA sensor? Okay. So combining these strategies to some sort of integrated on chip uh, amplification system. And so the strategy we came up with looks a little complicated, but let me walk you through it. Essentially, what we're doing is we're integrating an electrochemical transistor into a typical three electrode uh, electrochemical setup. So in red here, this would be the operation of the electrochemical transistor. And then these three electrodes, the working electrode, which is the gate and the counter electrode, as well as a reference electrode, are your uh, three electrode setup. This allows you to do... Um, uh, um, square wave voltammetry and cyclic voltammetry. And the key here is that the, uh, not only can we integrate these on chip, but what happens here is that the channel of the OECT doubles as the counter electrode in the three electrode setup. And so change in your um, redox probe activity, right, is actually reflected in the doping state of your counter electrode, which can be um, uh, measured as a change in conductance in an electrochemical transistor. Now, again, this is a little overcomplicated. Indeed, you might be guessing that you could uh, fuse the source and the counter electrode here, make this into one electrode. We're just sh simply showing this for clarity. Okay. So how does this referenced OECT, as I'll call it, basically an OECT that has a true reference, like a three electrode setup, how does it work? So you can actually see, we can uh, look at the typical cyclic voltammogram or indeed the square wave voltammetry and see that we have that redox peak due to the methylene blue. So now if we monitor the current 
right? This would essentially be the current of the working electrode or the gate of your transistor. If at the same time you now monitor that source drain current that I showed before in that channel, you actually see this step change or this change in slope in transconductance here effectively, right? So what is this change in slope? Well, actually, this is essentially what's due to the redox peak, right? So indeed, the change in slope is actually directly related to the integral of the gate current. Right? So this allows you to transduce the signal from the redox reporter directly. Now, if we compare this to a single um, traditionally functionalized electrochemical transistor where we operate it as a true OECT and we functionalize the gate with our optimer, you actually see the response here with the methylene blue is significantly muted and shifted to higher voltages. And in fact, when you have slight changes in your electrolyte environment or slight changes to binding here, the position of that peak shifts. And why is that? Well, that's because you don't have that reference. You don't have the reference electrode to fix your effective voltage at the electrode electrolyte interface. And you can see here a much higher change in your transconductance or much higher transconductance due to that redox reporter in your OECT signal. So why is this interesting? Well, now let's look how these perform in sensing with TGF beta one. So in the referenced OECT, you can again see these step changes here, the changes in your transconductance and your current voltage signal. And indeed what ends up happening is that with the referenced OECT, whether we're you do operating as a, as a cyclic voltammogram type mode or in a squ square wave voltammetry, we see an increase of three and a half thousand to 12,000 in our sensitivity. And that's basically because of that transduction uh, of the signal uh, in the uh, operation of the OECT, right? So we're going from 20 to 80 nanoamps per decade for the electrode to, in this case, we're looking at the difference in the, in the signal before and after this, this change in transconductance up to about 290 microamps per decade. Now you might notice that our limit of detection doesn't really change. And this isn't actually very surprising because the mechanism of transduction um, is is identical, right? You still have the same um, operation of a uh, redox reporter based aptimer at a metal electrode interface. Um, and all the OECT doing is amplifying that signal, right? You're actually using the same electrode in both of these experiments, the same working electrode or gate electrode. So basically this referenced OECT can improve the sensitivity, which is gonna be really critical for when you wanna integrate this into a bioelectronic device, let's say for an implant, um, uh, it gives you really much higher signals. You don't need specialized equipment to measure such low uh, currents. But it is amenable to the same types of improvements that you can do uh, to enhance signal for an electrode-based measurement. So here's an example of how you improve uh, your um, limit of detection by simply nanostructuring your uh, sensing electrode. Right, your working electrode. This is nanostructured gold. You can functionalize it in the same way. And with TGF beta one, you can now improve your limit of detection by two orders of magnitude, a hundred fold improvement down to about uh, 10 picograms per milliliter. And so these same strategies that we use can be effective uh, for uh, integrating into these referenced OECTs. And so with that, I want to wrap up. Um, I talked to you about how these active materials, these mixed conductors, these organic mixed conductors are going to help with non-traditional form factors and in improving ease of fabrication, but also how we can seamlessly integrate them uh, and uh, achieve some of this back-end functionality um, uh, in order to improve uh, applications in bioelectronics. So that's ranging from sensing to amplification, signal processing. I didn't talk about power generation, but I think we're going to hear more about that in a moment. Uh, as well as potentially decision-making and integrating some neuromorphic functionality in order to improve the efficiency, the integration, and the multimodality of uh, bioelectronics and potentially e-skins uh, for robotics. And so with that, uh, I'm going to thank all the people who did this work, who did all the hard work uh, shown in the picture here on a nice sunny day in Chicago. Uh, also going to thank our collaborators from, from whom we get really fantastic materials, uh, and as well as those at Argonne for, for studying these materials, and of course, uh, our funding sources uh, across the lab. Uh, and I'm happy to take, uh, I guess I'll take questions when we do the discussion uh, after uh, Chase. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very informative, I, I learned a lot myself too, so thank you. So uh, we will move on. Uh, so let me...
Okay, we will move on to the, the next amazing speaker, Professor Chase Cao. So uh, let me uh, briefly introduce his bio a little bit before I show him to everybody. So uh, Dr. Chase Cao is an assistant professor in mechanical and aerospace uh, engineering at Case Western Reserve University and directing the laboratory for soft machines and electronics. So he did his PhD at the uh, Australian National University and he did his postdoc associate at Duke uh, University and he served as an assistant professor at Michigan State University and then he joined the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Case Western Reserve University, uh, where he is now. So he got so many awards and then um, his research inter interest includes soft active materials and soft robotics, their power the soft electronic systems and 3D, 4D printing of advanced materials and structures. So um, you're going to hear about his research uh, work uh, today, and then which sounds very interesting. And I have uh, like uh, many, many lines that include his activities and his awards. So I I don't think I can list everything here. So uh, please welcome Professor Chase Kao here. Uh, Chase, so the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Misu, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, can you see? Yes, looks good. Okay, uh, so, hi, um, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, 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 I'm uh, Chi Stahl from Kispestin Reserve University. Uh, today I would like to uh, show our some work on the self-powered stretchable electronic systems uh, using the uh, low dimensional nanomaterials. So, uh, first, I would like to give a brief introduction about, uh, uh, about my group. And uh, um, the, uh, my group uh, mainly focuses on two things. The first one is to understand the fundamental mechanics and physics of advanced materials. Uh, the second one is to design and manufacture novel electronics and machines using advanced technologies. Uh, we expect to propose uh, some better solutions to the ground challenges in healthcare, manufacturing, energy, uh, agriculture, aerospace uh, exploration. So currently we focus on uh, three major topics. Uh, the first one is uh, soft materials uh, and the manufacturing materials. Uh, the second one is uh, step power of the soft electronics systems. Uh, so this is the one I will uh, introduce today. Uh, the third one is soft robotics and soft machines. So we develop some uh, the the miniaturized uh, the autonomous and collaborative robots. So uh, the soft electronics uh, can provide uh, superior uh, solutions to various fields. So uh, from the unprecedented uh, unprecedented materials and the tools, uh, the variable and uh, portable devices. Uh, the personalized healthcare monitoring system, and uh, you know the intelligent robots and machines. Uh, the uh, also you know the smart infrastructure and agriculture. So we devote ourselves to the design and manufacturing uh, and mechanics of soft uh, electronics. So the first part today, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the printed flexible spread for electronics. So. Uh, we have done some work in the past few years. Uh, actually, uh, you know, in the last uh, one to two decades, uh, we have observed dramatic advances uh, in emerging soft electronics uh, for many applications. So uh, 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 many examples, uh, for example, the uh, variable spread sensors, uh, you know, the epidermal sensors, uh, food sensors, and uh, a human machine interaction interface. So uh, this device has a huge market. Uh, you know, it is uh, ex um, estimated that the variable electronics market uh, will grow to uh, almost uh, the 50 billion US dollars by 2026. So the key features of uh, these new emerging electronics is to maintain their stable performance and the functionality when subjected to uh, the large strings. Uh, such as the bending, uh, you know, the uh, twisting, uh, stretching, 
So this requirement uh, poses new challenges for the materials, uh, structures, and manufacturing technologies. So for the uh, soft electronics, so we usually want to have some multiple functionality, but uh, low cost. So based on the potential applications, uh, we need to invent you know, the fabrication uh, uh, the approach, uh, reduce the cost, so uh, increase the, the product uh, through output. So printing method uh, has uh, become a major driving uh, force to achieve the goals for large scale, uh, the large area applications. Currently, uh, people are using this four uh, kind of the printing method to do. Uh, the one is uh, the first one is screen printing, uh, the granular printing, inkjet printing, and aerosol jet printing. So for each method, they have their own pros and cons. And uh, um, uh, here uh, in my group, uh, we mainly using two methods. One is for the screen printing, another is the aerosol jet printing. So um, in particular, uh, I would like to introduce, you know, the aerosol data printing. This is a relatively new technology. Uh, it has two automation methods uh, to do the printing. One is for the ultrasonic uh, automation. Another is uh, the pneumatic automation. The viscosity, uh, the vis viscosity of the printing inks uh, can be uh, pretty large, uh, can be as, as large as 1,000 uh, 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 centipoids. So we can use it to print uh, conducting, semiconducting, and uh, dielectric materials uh, for different kinds of electronics, uh, like uh, transistors, sensors, uh, you know, IFRDs, memory stores. So uh, they can also use it to print some biological uh, inks uh, and uh, print it on non-flat surface, uh, you know, for some three-dimensional uh, circuitry. Uh, so uh, my group has used it to fabricate uh, a, a few uh, different types of electronics, uh, the transistors, uh, uh, you know, memory, st uh, memory stores, supercapacitors, uh, and the three-dimensional uh, structures. So um, here uh, I would like to uh, show our, we, um, you know, uh, develop some fully printed uh, the carbon and tube thin film transistors. So uh, this is for the first time, you know, we printed the whole uh, device uh, together at that moment. So uh, we use an aerosol printing to print in the salt and drain electrodes using nanoparticles. And uh, we using the semiconducting uh, carbon and tube uh, as the, uh, the channel, the channel. And uh, we use, the, uh, you know, the dielectrics here, the dielectric electric layer we also printed is we using the SDID. It's, uh, it's a kind of polymer. Uh, and uh, so we uh, started the different configurations uh, to take, compare the performance of the device, uh, both top side, um, top gated and the bottom gated. So uh, here, this is the transfer curve and this output curve. So we, you can see the history is actually uh, pretty small. Although it's not achieved to the zero, uh, you know, the, the ideal limit, um, but uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, pretty low enough compared to you know the normal um, CND based uh, thin film transistors. So the hysteresis may be larger than a thirty volt. So here, um, uh, based on this uh, printed uh, dielectrics, we also measure the uh, you know the uh, the stress and uh, do uh, did the stress analysis and uh, um, as the scan voltage increases from ten to forty volts. Uh, we did not see a significant change of the uh, transfer curves. So this is something uh, desirable properties. Um, our four pre uh, fully printed uh, the Flex4 CNT uh, uh, thin film transistor also demonstrated uh, very good performance in, bend, uh, in bending and uh, reliability test. So the devices can uh, still work very well uh, even the bending radius is as small as uh, one uh, millimeter and uh, repeated the bending for over 1,000 times. So uh, it's, you can see the, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's completed all left for the um, uh, transfer curves. So there's no overvista performance uh, degradation observed. 
compared to with other uh, dielectrics shown in literature, so our printed dielectronics, uh, dielectrics gives a uh, very attractive performance uh, in the printed uh, CNT TFTs. So uh, small uh, hysteresis at threshold voltage. So uh, for a two months period, you know, the hysteresis, the threshold voltage and the mobility, you know, is uh, keeps a uh, uh, nearly constant. Uh, here it's induced some, uh, you know, some the the, the uh, uh, large experimental errors. Uh, you know, based on we tested on a curved surface, uh, sometimes they they may have some uh, contact resistance difference. So uh, the printed device can maintain their uh, performance for quite a long time in the uh, open air uh, ambient conditions. Uh, to fabricate flexible stretchable electronics, we usually need uh, to uh, uh, fabricate on a, a suitable substrate, uh, different polymers, uh, you know, silicon, uh, silicon rubbers, uh, hard layers, and uh, cellulose fibers uh, are used uh, for substrate materials. However, these materials, um, you know, although they have some advantage, um, but they are um, uncomfortable to wear in direct contact with the uh, human skin. So uh, uh, different from the the, the uh, normal, you know, the general uh, the substrate material textile, um, you know, is while the most uh, available uh, cloth materials um, uh, is considered to be an ideal, uh, you know, substrate for flexible and stretchable electronics. Uh, so it's uh, for some uh, direct contact with our skins. So uh, it has a, uh, uh, you know. The many attractive uh, properties. Um, uh, for example, our standing mechanical property, uh, you know, good flexibility and softness, uh, conform or contact with skins. So it's an excellent wear uh, comfort. So the um, so uh, we uh, you know uh, attempt uh, attempt to uh, develop a new smart uh, electronic textiles, so that can integrate uh, the. Uh, functionality of the electronics and the comfort of uh, textiles. Uh, we developed a screen printing process here, uh, you know, to de deposit a uh, water-based uh, conductive uh, ink on the textile surface with a uh, predefined uh, mask screens. So we, uh, after we printing, uh, the, we further spray uh, coat a thin layer of invisible uh, waterproofing uh, agent uh, on top of the conducting layer to pre uh, to prevent the cracking of the electrodes. So the new uh, water-based uh, uh, conductive ink uh, were made out of the silver uh, fractal uh, dendrite. So and a transparent binder. So uh, we dispersed it into a mixed uh, a mixture of the solvents. Uh, so the DI water, uh, the, the the EJ, and the, the uh, the EA. So in a volume ratio of one to two uh, to two. So the conductive uh, silver fractal dendrite uh, has a hierarchical structures uh, to form a percolation uh, network of the printing. So uh, with the same conductive uh, the failure percentage. So here with the conductive failure of the silver, uh, we have 25%, uh, but we change the, the binder ratios. Uh, from 25% to 55%. So for the different recipes, we tested the performance, the conductivity, and uh, so uh, we find the desired, uh, you know, but uh, we also need to here, you know, to uh, tailor the uh, rheological properties of the inks uh, with the water absorption uh, of the textile to ensure uh, high quality of the patent, uh, the patent printing on textiles. Uh, we actually found uh, thirty five percent and forty five percent. You know, the binder uh, we can get a better electro uh, electrical conducting uh, performance. We can use the uh, selected ink uh, to print the high quality circuitry on the uh, textiles. So from the, the top surface and the cross section uh, image uh, of the printed electronics, we can see uh, the uh, uh, percolation networks formed on. Uh, the surface. So uh, we can see for the thirty-five percent and forty-five percent, uh, you know, at a different strength from zero uh, from zero to one hundred percent, 
uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, a larger than thirty five percent can maintain uh, uh, conductive net, uh, networks. So the information mainly comes from here. Uh, we in situ to check, uh, you know, the deformations. Uh, the deformation mainly comes from this uh, this uh, gap size, uh, gap parts. So the, these two sections, section one and section two, so it forms the ring course. So and the larger ring course is from here. Uh, the printed e, uh, e textiles have excellent water resistance. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the good uh, permeability and outstanding uh, wear resistance. Uh, even we immersed in water, you know, for a uh, long time, it has still maintained its conductivity. And uh, after for washing multiple times and uh, uh, stretching and releasing for multiple times, uh, they still can maintain a good performance. Uh, we demonstrated the printed e, uh, um, textiles uh, uh, as a strength sensors. So it has uh, the strength sensors. Uh, we, it can uh, measure the strength uh, up to one hundred fifty percent, and uh, other different under the cyclic uh, testing. And we can still, we can have a good uh, repeatability, and this shows the repeatability uh, is a pretty good, excellent uh, stability for long term uh, durable use. Uh, we also demonstrated the printed uh, e textiles uh, can be used as a draw heater, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the excellent heating performance. So uh, applied 1.6 uh, volts and only a few, you know, uh, in less than uh, 40 seconds, it can increase to uh, 180 degrees. So it can serve as tool for uh, personalized hair, um, Personalized the thermal management or medical treatment, uh, such as the cold preparation, you know, the uh, hyperthermia. Um, so here, uh, this is uh, a video you uh, you will see, uh, and uh, the deformations, you know, uh, the it still can maintain a good performance. Uh, there is no degradation of the performance. Okay. Uh, so uh, due to the excellent electrical uh, performance of the textile, we uh, use it to, to uh, develop some the uh, electrostatic uh, smart clothing. So the drop heater, uh, so here at the different uh, loca locations, we can use that to monitor, uh, manage and control the body temperature. Uh, the string sensors uh, formed with the printed uh, the uh, patterns can monitor the motions uh, state of the users, and uh, uh, its performance uh, we are not affected. Uh, you know, not uh, affected by sweat and water. So, uh, this is a, a demo uh, for the uh, motion detection. Uh, inspired by famous game, uh, we recently uh, proposed a new textile-based uh, tactile sensor. So this tensile sensor is a self-powered, and uh, it consists of two layers on top layer and bottom layer, and uh, the the top layer uh, is a triple electric nano generator, and uh, the um, is used to mimic the fast adapting mechanical receptor, and uh, the um, uh, bottom layer is a piezo resistive sensor for mimicking the uh, slow adapting mechanical receptor. It can be used to detect the uh, you know the pulse uh, the, the pulse rate and uh, the human motion and uh, also you know the voice patterns uh, material recognition and uh, the, as the you know human machine interface. So this uh, this is the uh, the, the sensors the small sensors on top surface that nanomaterials. So um, uh, let me show some results. Okay, this is the uh, uh, the um, slow adapting uh, the sensors made of the you know the piezo resistive sensing layer, so it can uh, use the, to detect uh, the voice uh, you know uh, the small uh, the small width um, of the uh, the small pressures. So um, it uh, demonstrated a fast response and the recovery behaviors. So the repeatability, uh, you know, the repeatability. And the robustness of the uh, sensor uh, are excellent. So um, the SA sensor, uh, you know, can be used for real-time uh, monitoring of physiological signals. 
so if uh, mounted on different locations um, on the human body, it can detect uh, the uh, the human motion, and uh, it can um, obviously distinguish the uh, PTD uh, the patterns uh, from the parts. So the um, fast adapting uh, sensor, uh, so it uh, from the triple electric nano generator, it can uh, detect the surface textures and uh, identify the material types. Uh, so if we combine it with the uh, uh, machine learning, uh, you know, uh, it can distinguish the materials uh, with accuracy, uh, you know, larger than ninety nine percent. Uh, in addition, the new skin uh, inspired sensors can, uh, you know, resolve the complex uh, stimuli and uh, control the uh, soft robots. So here uh, is the all the different uh, uh, to sense the uh, the stiffness, the hardness of the touch ob uh, objects. So uh, this uh, human machine interface uh, can control the manipulators for uh, grasping and bending uh, to perform perform different. Uh, uh, the gestures. Okay, uh, the second part uh, is a highly uh, stretchable uh, electron uh, energy devices for compatible systems. So, um, magazine um, is uh, one uh, of the most promising materials for wearable devices. So it has been demonstrated for different kind of applications, uh, you know, uh, due to its high capacity, so high conductivity, and uh, uh, you know the the uh, mechanical uh, the uh, electrochemical performance. Uh, however, uh, we found uh, you know there was little work on the stretchable devices uh, with the Maxim. Uh, we tried to build some, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't uh, succeed. Uh, so the the major uh, um, the challenge is the cracking issues here. Uh, so uh, if we apply the strain uh, to the to the substrate after releasing, it will uh, you know um, break into uh, the many pieces uh, have crack issues. So even if we apply the strain, it's uh, as small as uh, fifty percent. It cannot uh, uh, survive. So the cracking uh, significantly decreases the conductivity of the thin films. So it uh, that's people why uh, people didn't use it as the stretchable device. So uh, inspired by the reinforced uh, the mild in civil engineering, uh, so we proposed uh, um, uh, a method to reinforce the vaccine with the reduced carbon dioxide. So after adding a, a percentage of the reduced carbon dioxide, we can completely remove the plants occurred on the surface, so in the stretchable electrodes after relaxation. So that makes it to maintain its electrochemical performance uh, quite good. So uh, the mechanical and the electrical testing reveal that the, uh, you know, the complete uh, with one to one uh, weight ratio uh, maintains the lowest uh, the resistance. Okay. And uh, uh, the strain limit increases as, uh, compared to this increased uh, uh, graphene oxide, we reduce the graphene oxide, uh, so we can uh, increase the, the uh, breaking strain. Break, uh, breaking strain. So it's uh, uh, the mechanical uh, cyclic test. Uh, you know, uh, also uh, demonstrated here is uh, this has good uh, the larger percentage have better performance. Uh, the cracking uh, uh, generated in the relaxation process are attributed to the high mechanical uh, modulus and the small flake size of the uh, maximum films. So compared to the uh, maxine, you know, the reduced carbon oxide film possesses uh, a lower uh, Young's modulus, uh, stronger inter-sheet interactions, and a higher uh, elongation at the break. So make it more compliant to the extreme mechanical deformations or strains uh, in the relaxation process. So the small size of the maximum film, you know, uh, is uh, uh, was important to uh, facilitate ionic uh, transport and achieve good electro uh, chemical uh, electrochemical performance. Uh, the larger uh, reduced graphene oxide uh, uh, flake size. Uh, can lead to stronger uh, intersheet interactions by increasing the face-to-face uh, -face interactions area and reducing the air-to-air -air inter air -air 
edge uh, interactions. So uh, the performance comparison, uh, you know, this is the pure Maxine uh, and this is the Maxine uh, composite. So you can see the short difference and uh, this uh, with the uh, composite electrodes, we can maintain its performance at a different uh, scan rate at, at a larger strains that larger than uh, you know, the 200% strain. So here uh, for the both the bianxo and the unaxo electrodes, uh, you know, they demonstrated the consistent uh, results. So no different change, uh, no much change compared to the uh, you know the uh, relaxed state. So that's the uh, uh, significant, significantly improved the uh, uh, electrochemical performance. So we also, uh, you know, built a double layer of the electro uh, the superfasters. And uh, here we using the PVA uh, sulfuric acid as the gel electrolyte. Uh, so it also serves as a separator. So uh, you can see for the device, uh, you know, from zero strain to 300% strain. So it can maintain a, a nice uh, the, a record handler shape for the CV curves. So uh, uh, the applied strings uh, has a little effect on the uh, uh, device performance. So uh, in order to develop a, a compatible manufacturing process uh, for the straightforward electronic systems, so the system we means uh, the, the both parts, you know, the electronics parts and the uh, the power source, uh, the uh, power supply. And uh, here we develop a 4D printing uh, approach uh, to fabricate uh, the uh, stretchable electrodes uh, uh, directly uh, for uh, multiple uh, the you know the circuitry uh, components. So we use the aerosolite printing and we stretch the substrate, hold it there, and then printing the after that we uh, sintering uh, the inks and uh, relax, and it forms some patterns. So here for the um, for the hybrid materials, we uh, consist of CNT, RDO, and the conductive polymers. So it can form a, a, a composite. So it's uh, meet the printing requirement uh, compatibility with the substrate, and uh, enable you know the the good electrochemical uh, performance. So uh, we uh, still are using the double layer uh, structure, and uh, we tested the performance. And this is the uh, by axle stretching uh, and uh, the strings uh, 200 by 200 strings, it can maintain an uh, ideal, uh, very uh, nice, uh, the you know, chemical performance. So the charge discharge and uh, you know the specific capacities also does not affect it by the strings. So uh, since this is the printing method, uh, we can fabricate the different kind of the shapes and uh, you know arbitrary shapes and uh, you know different design. Uh, different uh, configurations uh, at the desired uh, positions. So we can fabricate, uh, you know, the arrays and uh, either series or uh, uh, parallel or series uh, uh, connected together to uh, accommodate uh, the requirements for the voltage and current uh, in the applications. So this for the, uh, you know, the, this, uh, 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 finally, uh, I want to show uh, a work, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, quite a different from the previous, uh, you know, the thin film based. Here we use the common tube forest uh, to serve as a material uh, model. We can fabricate, uh, you know, different kind of sensors, uh, the super capacitors, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, inner device here. Uh, this, uh, this we fabricate, you know, the, this vertical line. Uh, this is, uh, we expect it can uh, uh, Better performance uh, compared to the lie down uh, thin films. So um, one challenging uh, to fabricate this is uh, the transfer process. You know the transfer process was not a very straightforward. We uh, used a thermal oxidation uh, oxidation assisted approach to uh, successful transfer the CNT uh, forest onto the stretchable electrodes uh, electro, uh, substrate. Uh, due to the unique properties and the robustness uh, in com uh, accommodating the large strings, you know, even the strings here are larger than the pre string in the fabrication process, we can use it to fabricate, uh, you know, it still can maintain a good uh, performance. It will not fail. Uh, so uh, this is some uh, advantage. 
And the crumpled uh, the CNT uh, based uh, stretch for uh, silver capacitors, you know, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, very good uh, the electrochemical performance and the mechanical stretchability. So the CV curves have a record have a record have a shape, you know, uh, is typical. This is typical for the double layer chip capacitors. So compared to other uh, devices, uh, you know, this work for the stretchability and uh, the specific capacities. Uh, uh, here we only compare with the uh, carbon and tube based uh, the materials, and um, because it's uh, uh, for other you know the, the material like maxine is two uh, D uh, materials is uh, some different uh, material properties. Uh, but the strategy is uh, is uh, uh, it's uh, it's used it's uh, it's useful. It can also you know use some nano rod and nano wire uh, materials. Uh, so this is the device uh, and uh, uh, you know the spread for uh, under the biaxial cases. So biaxial is uh, is uh, slightly uh, uh, changed. Uh, this this many during the measuring pro performance. Uh, mer sorry. The measuring process, you know, the uh, the rigid electrodes has some uh, contact issues with the soft substrate for a long time. Uh, you know, the stretching and relaxation process. So this actually uh, was highlighted by Nature uh, briefing. So it's uh, it's uh, this work is uh, uh, okay. Um, finally, um, you know, uh, our current effort in my group, you know, uh, in this field, uh, we. Be working on the variables and the bi-integrated electronics. So we're trying to uh, build some new devices uh, in particular for biomedical applications. And uh, mm, yeah, uh, so uh, another uh, another focus is uh, for uh, scalable manufacturing. So we're trying to build uh, uh, a new system and to uh, increase the high throughput, uh, the, the fabrication. Uh, how to make it more uh, uh, afford affordable and uh, reliable? Um, finally, uh, you know, uh, we uh, I want to uh, summarize my talk here. Uh, we developed some uh, new inks and the printing process to fabricate the transistor sensors and energy devices. Uh, so here, we're mainly using low dimensional nanomaterials can be either zero D, one D, two D. Okay. And we uh, proposed the new designs for the skin inspired uh, tactile sensors. Uh, you know, it uh, can be used for monitoring uh, health conditions and uh, control the soft robots. So we uh, develop a new approaches and manufacturing technologies to fabricate uh, highly stretchable um, the electrodes and supercapacitors. So um, we, uh, yeah, hopefully we can develop some uh, new sensors also in this field. Um, Finally, I want to uh, thank my group members, uh, uh, the current members and past members, and our, my collaborators, uh, you know, uh, and uh, different uh, institutions. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the, um, uh, you know, the funding support uh, from the government agencies. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us the, the, your uh, sharing your talk um, despite your health condition. Thank you so much, Chase. So uh, thank you, you Yeah. Would you stop sharing? Oh, thank you. So that I can share my screen. Okay. So now it's time together and then have a chat about your research. Um, and then uh, your academic career or anything about yeah our life. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, for Jonathan, so do you have any questions or 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 over Chase's uh, research a little bit first? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I found it uh, very very exciting. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as someone coming from the polymer electronics world, I know that making inks out of you know nanomaterials and things like that. Um, is kind of the core of what you were talking about, but uh, it would be great to hear if there's any developments on uh, processing and 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 uh, scalable manufacturing of conducting polymer-based materials, especially in potentially integrating new active materials with the new functionality. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Actually, uh, we also using some conducting polymers. You know, many is uh, the the commercial uh, available one is uh, the p dot uh, ph uh, one thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we using it for some uh, you know the printed electrodes and the uh, e-clicker for biomedical applications. I think uh, it has uh, uh, good biocompatibility, and uh, you know, um, but definitely uh, you know the original uh, the the conducting polymer. Their conduct, conductivity is not as good as it, you know, uh, we want sometimes. You know, you can use some method to further enhance its, uh, its uh, conductivity. Yeah, yeah I, I, conductive I, I, I like, traces, I like your, <laughs> Yeah, I like your, your work very much, actually. Uh, you know, the, the vertical um, also uh, can grant uh, for your new paper published in Nature. So uh, it's, uh, it's meant for work. So uh, I actually a few were uh, a few years ago we uh, we are with a Pusa and Duke uh, you know I, I talked uh, I discussed uh, at, actually uh, but uh, we didn't make make it work and uh, for the vertical line the you know the, the transistors and uh, mm, uh, yeah uh, from uh, we have uh, one colleagues you know from Army Lab and uh, we we had some discussion uh, then both of we left and we have, we have no chance to to work on that anymore <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we can we can find a chance to discuss it further for for your uh, specific work. Fantastic. Yeah, both of you can come to Korea to make that discussion. So um, so include me too. So <laughs> so naturally <laughs> <laughs> naturally back to Jonathan. So I have a question. So I think uh, it might be really challenge. It must be really challenging. So uh, to apply your systems into the uh, the biological system in in actual systems. So depending on the biological system, for example, like depending on the part of our body. So, would there be any different approaches, approaches or strategies to design your device architecture or select the materials? It might be a little bit broad question, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think ultimately it depends on the form factor that uh, that the active materials take. So, um, you know, of course, if we're talking about materials that are either meant to bridge electrical signaling like a cardiac patch or or some sort of electrode um, to be used on the skin or on tissue then of course you know all the strategies that chase talked about and and you know making you know pre-strained or deterministic you know serpentine like structures uh is very very helpful um i think the place where uh organics uh polymer based materials really succeed i think is in taking on um, well, first, in taking on form factors in in three d, right? So uh, and not not like two d plus, you know, for example, pop out structures, but really having scaffold and hydrogel like structures that might be helpful for um, uh, accelerating tissue regeneration, uh, for example, nerves or bone or or, or things like that, um, or um, uh, kind of structures that that can take on that kind of uh, uh, architected form. Um, but if we're making thin film electronics, which is most of what we talked about, uh, what most of what I talked about in my talk, um, I think the strategies of integrating those active materials into uh, circuits, um, as we see, you know, with a lot of different materials, including some of the work that either Chase showed or, or um, uh, motivated uh, his, his talk with, um, then I don't think there's really many limitations um, from a bio biocompatibility perspective. Many of these materials, um, of course, every time we develop a new type of material, we have to test the biocompatibility. But many of the materials that that uh, that I, I showed um, have evidence that they that they do work well once they're properly um, uh, purified uh, and sterilized. So I don't think uh, from a biocompatibility perspective. Uh, that'll be too challenging of an issue. Oh, okay. Uh, less challenging than expected. So that's a good news. We'll so see. Maybe I'm being too optimistic. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on yeah. mechanical matter materials uh, for the uh, for the past years and now. So probably we can we can provide some great designs uh, of mechanical matter materials that can match with the uh, the bone factor that can be flexible and then with some functionalities that we want. Very but I think about it more. So. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, I have uh, questions for both of you. So uh, since you're dealing with those uh, materials for wearable or bio, like a human human interface uh, as, um, application systems, so we have to think about, I think, uh, the sensitivity to hum uh, humidity and the heat or the, the environment things. So what would you um, say about those, yeah, the environmental sensitivity? about your device. Yeah, Chase, you want to go first? Oh, okay. <laughs> so actually, uh, that's a good question. So uh, I think that's uh, uh, mainly uh, related to the reliability and uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the robustness of the, the sensing. Um, currently, we see you know, uh, for most literature, uh, we didn't see much report about, uh, you know, if uh, any interference between different parameters, you know how the environment change will affect uh, the device performance. Uh, uh, because most time, you know, um, people just work in the lab environment, and then you know even do some demo is still in the lab conditions. You know, no much, no much change. Sometimes uh, even we ignore the, you know, to to some we think it's the noise. But uh, uh, but uh, uh, for the real application, you know, in particular, you know, uh, your your outdoor you know activities, uh, that really need uh, to uh, you know consider such a kind the uh, the humidity and uh, you know the you know, the temperature change. Uh, for example, you know, for some material sensitivity, uh, is uh, they may uh, so multiple factors affect is uh, uh, will induce some signal change. So you need to avoid, uh, you know, the possible interference. Uh, how to, uh, you know, uh, eliminate uh, the the interference between different par parameters. Make, a, for example, the string uh, measurement, you know, string sensors. You want it to uh, be independent of the temperature change, mm -hmm. and you you don't want to, you know, uh, the uh, in in the low temperature and high temperature you have different, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, signal levels, so mm -hmm. that uh, will induce the you know the false or inaccuracy uh, in the in the report. Uh, in particular, you know if you want to monitor the health conditions, so that has uh, that may induce larger larger error, large uh, larger difference. And uh, uh, another possible way, uh, you know, but that's you you how to decouple, you know, the coupling effect, uh, coupling factors in the uh, device design. And uh, the um, uh, another, I think, opportunity is how to use in the uh, machine learning method based uh, based approach and to uh, you know uh, track the uh, fluctuation, you know, the variations and the different situations, and you can do some composition for the signals and the different conditions to to meet the requirements to maintain a higher level uh, accuracy, uh, you know. Uh, to focus on what the parameters you want to uh, have, yeah. That, that's that's my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would just add real quickly. I think uh, with the organic materials, I think uh, materials design comes into the stability with respect to um, uh, humidity, for example. Right. So we already know that materials like P dot PSS. They're very hygroscopic. They take up water very easily, and so I think oftentimes, you know, you see you see many papers on people talking about PDOT as a humidity sensor. Um, it senses a lot of things, um, but um, you know, there are newer materials, or uh, if you process PDOT in such a way that you remove the excess PSS, or if you have materials that form kind of nanofibrils, um, those materials actually don't swell passively very much at all in the presence of water, and so you can start to think about materials design strategies at really the molecular um, or kind of mesoscopic level in order to control whether or not they are responsive to humidity or not. Some cases you want that, in some cases you don't. Oh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. So would you have any other questions for each other in terms of research? Probably in person oh. later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so if, yes, uh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, maybe I ask an uh, additional question. And uh, yeah. so, uh, Jonathan, uh, for the 
uh, for the neural electronics, so now, uh, you know, uh, do you think what's the, uh, the what's the major challenge to to uh, develop some some good, you know, desirable uh, neural electronics? Are you talking more for sensing or for kind of neuro inspired, like neuromorphic computing type things? Uh, sensing. Uh, sensing. Sensing. Yeah. Um, yeah you... What are the biggest challenges? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, is the, the the case with organics uh, across the board. I think is that every time you make a small change, you need to reevaluate the material. You know, both its processing, uh, its stability, its biocompatibility, as I mentioned before. Uh, and so, I think there's a lot of really promising materials, but because we're so excited about playing with new chemistries and everything. Uh, in order to explore new function and new properties, it means every time we have to reevaluate stability, biocompatibility, and everything. But I do think that there's uh, a lot of promise in making, you know, micron scale devices that can give you, you know, large scale sensing arrays for neural activity, uh, even as I mentioned, kind of on site signal processing that I think will be uh, exciting for, uh, for uh, applications in neuroscience and neurotech. Thank you. Okay, now I think uh, we can talk about our research, um, non-research, but research life. So, <laughs> so uh, here uh, we are here together because you are the young scientist of World Deed. So I wanted to ask uh, what motivated you to apply for this ICANX uh, young, sci young Scientist Award, like Chase? <laughs> And then uh, uh, the next question is, after you got the word, uh, what, what would be your meaning? So what would you say about that? So say something nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, this question, how to, how to answer? Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, your first question is why to... Uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay. If I say uh, why, it sounds too aggressive. But what? How? Um, uh, how did you get the information, and how? Uh, what motivated you to apply for this award and the meaning of the award? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, you know, I know this uh, the ICANN X uh, platform for quite a long time, and uh, you know, I, I was involved in multiple uh, the V channel groups, uh, and uh, you know, from X. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, uh, so it, uh, I, I like it my, uh, very much actually. So I um, you know the uh, the cutting edge research. Uh, you know I can get many uh, you know playing uh, much things from the talks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, uh, the, I think the message is from from the community, and then they posted and. Uh, you know, advised uh, the the information. I know. Uh, I think, uh, uh, but uh, I definitely, you know, uh, it's a competitive, and uh, I, I just uh, fortunate, you know, I have some. The I uh, appreciate uh, the committee, like uh, the work I have done. Uh, you know, in the past few years, uh, I think it's a uh, it's a good, uh, uh, also a recognition uh, for my uh, group and. Uh, you know the my uh, the collaborators uh, to the for the for the efforts. Uh, also, you know, finally I have the guest the boss. I have the new uh, opportunity uh, chance to interact with the uh, uh, peers and uh, like Jonathan, you know, and many others, and uh, we have the, the the chance to communicate and to present our uh, new work and uh, to interact with. Uh, more people uh, to get people know. Uh, more people know our work. Uh, as a you know, as a professor in university, that's something we really like. To, really like to do is uh, uh, we we travel to different places that attend the conference. You know, that's the same. That's the, the same purpose, and uh, we want to uh, let people know what we we have done, and uh, you know what uh, uh, try to generate. Uh, uh, um, you know, the bigger impact, and uh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. It's so meaningful. So, <laughs> Jonathan, now you have a burden. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, no, I, I heard about ICANX from Twitter, if I'll say it there. 
Um, but uh, I, I thought it was, um, uh, I found this platform uh, to be very exciting. Um, you know, we're used, so used to, you know, the, the extent to which we disseminate our work is either papers or conferences. And I think both of those, there's a, uh, can be challenges to access that and to have broad reach, right? I think in a lot of places around the world, uh, subscriptions to certain journals or, or the ability to travel to a, a, a national or international conference can be quite limited. And so you, I think you end up talking to many of the same people. You do make some great connections, and that's, of course, something that we have to do. Um, but having a platform like this that is, um, uh, you know, very accessible, free uh, uh, throughout the world, uh, it's a good way to um, not only continue to disseminate your work, but uh, as Chase said, you know, make new connections, uh, potentially new collaborators and, and meet new people. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I uh, I'm one of the members who started, uh, not exactly the started, but like earliest members, uh, who joined the uh, the ICANX platforms. Now it's been like three years. I don't know. So <laughs> it's been too old, and I'm a, I, this is my almost my like routine. At least once a month, I have to do the moderator, and then it's my great pleasure, and then to meet new people, and then like today, I learned a lot, and then. Like communicating with you like over online and then uh there was one person you know uh professor deep jariwala we have met on over i can ask talk like for two years for the past years and then we finally met in person and then it was so natural because we thought that we already met before so it was a great feeling and it was a great connection so i hope that i can meet you in person soon and then uh in relation to this uh Young Science Awarded and big, big congratulations because I was on the committee. I saw all the documents and then trust me, you you com compete with all these like amazing candidates and then you were the awardees. So you were the final 10 awardees. So one of the two of the other 10 awardees. And I was so proud of you and I was so envious because I don't think I can apply for that part and I could I could get it so <laughs> so congratulations so, so much and then so I think uh do you have any other questions to share or to talk about not really so I think it's yeah, a great yeah. time yes it's a great time to wrap up and thank you so much for uh, sharing your interesting research and an inspiring one and then here's a like <laughs> virtual uh, online certificate. I'd like to deliver the certificate to Jonathan first. And then we are so proud of you. And thank you so much for uh, becoming a, a great member of the ICANX Talks. And then I have to see you very frequently from now on forever <laughs> for the next thank you so much. years. Thank you. And Chase, so this is your certificate. I would love to deliver it in person, but probably later, maybe at the end of the year when Alice uh, invites us. <laughs> so, okay, so and uh, congratulations so much again, and we are so proud of you on behalf of all the committee members. Thank you, Miso. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay, much. And, yes, and Alice will send out these certificates to you by email later. Okay, so this is it, Thank and then we have, yes, and we had a great, uh, wonderful Friday with these amazing speakers. And next week, uh, there are a, there is an amazing group again, so coming up. So, uh, please join us uh, for Professor Federico's talk, and then there are amazing panelists again. So we are very looking forward to it, and please join us again next Friday at the same time, uh, 8 p.m. in Beijing, and uh, depending on the time, uh, where you, where you live. So this is I can next talks, and then thank you so much, everybody. Um, see you next week. Bye bye. Put
的在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞、啊。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤。努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞跃。I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。